Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, tonight's XRX live stream. Um, my name is Claire Farrell, and um, I'm here to host the XRX panel chat review, reflecting on our April uh, anniversary from the 2019 International Rebellion, which you might remember as our kind of first major, major rebellion in London. Um, so uh, we've got a really good panel today of people who are going to be answering some questions. We've got George Marshall, who is the founder of Climate Outreach, Europe's leading specialists in climate change and public engagement and communications. He's got a really strong track record uh, in reaching new and non-green audiences, especially. George has worked for 30 years at all levels of the environmental movement from British direct action in the 1990s as a senior campaigner for Greenpeace US and the Rainforest Foundation and as a strategic advisor to governments and international institutions. And he strongly believes that real lasting change has always needed a range of sectors and tactics a broad-based social mandate with alliances across the political spectrum. He's the author of Don't Even Think About It, Why Our Brains Are Wired to Ignore Climate Change and Carbon Detox. We're also joined by Sarah Lunnan, um, also a, a member of Extinction Rebellion's political circle, um, a frequent and excellent spokesperson for our movement, and she's a former Green Party councillor for Stroud. Joined by Sarah Zoltash, um, artist and diviner coordinator of Extinction Rebellion's UK vision sensing circle and a co-host of XRTV. Um, Sarah became an icon of London's April 2019 rebellion after offering their critically acclaimed adaptation of the Islamic call to prayer in front of our pink boat in Oxford Circus. We've also got Liam Norton who is an electrician from uh, South London who first came into contact with Extinction Rebellion at the blockade of five London bridges in November 2018 and he's been involved with actions ever since and is also a great spokesperson for the movement. And Rupert Reid, a member of Extinction Rebellion's political circle, frequent spokesperson for the movement and an associate professor of philosophy at the University of East Anglia, a former Green Party councillor for Norwich and a national parliamentary and European candidate for the party. Okay, so we've got a series of questions lined up and you guys uh, who are watching can send them in to us. So we'll start taking your questions a little later on. Um, just also to let you know that uh, we'll be doing lots more live streaming from XR. Um, all of next week, there are uh, live streams promoting um, focus on the finance industry. That'll be 4.30 till 7.30 every day next week. And tomorrow at 6.30, uh, a panel with XR Youth. Uh, reflecting on their experience last April. <clears throat> on Saturday at five o'clock, you can tune in to Extinction Rebellion for a live stream on Citizens' Assemblies, or you can catch Rupert Reid uh, at 5 p.m. talking to Alistair McIntosh, and you can find the details for that through Rupert's um, personal Twitter feed. Okay, so let's get going with a question. I'm going to open the panel with um, something for Liam Norton. So, Liam, we've had Lots of comments from uh, the public and the media about how Extinction Rebellion seems to have attracted a sort of broader appeal than the uh, established climate activist world in the last um, 30 years or so. So let's hear from you. Why do you think that is? Have we got yeah, you? Thanks. yeah, thanks, Claire. Um, well, I think from my own experience, what happened to me was um, I remember buying a copy of The Guardian in, um, I think it was on the Declaration of Rebellion, and it was um, the Archbishop of Canterbury was saying that um, the time had come um, for civil disobedience, basically, um, to take action against climate change. And, and for me, like somebody who, like, a little bit ashamed to say, but I was just going to work. I was getting on with my life. I wasn't necessarily thinking about um, climate. I mean, subconsciously, I think I was th thinking about climate change, but there was always like an element of denial, I think, that I was like experiencing. And for me, like the, the, the really powerful thing was that the 
the, the, the fact that somebody like the, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Wayne Brown Williams, was sort of calling for people, um, for civil disobedience and for people to go out and get arrested for, for a cause was something that really pricked up my interest. Um, so that caused me to like go down to the uh, bridges in November. But I was kind of like an observer, really. I wasn't really, didn't really feel like I could, um, there, it was something that I could necessarily jump straight into and get involved with. I was kind of going as an observer. Um, I had a conversation with my friend who'd like recently had a child. Um, and he uh, said to me, um, he's obviously worried about climate change. You know, he just had a child and he was going, um, have you heard about this extinction? He, he used the word mob. He's like, you heard of this extinction rebellion mob? And I went, yeah, yeah. I said, I've been down to, I went down to the bridges like uh, last year. You know, I think they've got a point. And then, um, so we having a chat. And then later on that evening, I looked up online and I saw that they were doing talks all over the city, all over London. They were doing these talks, these heading for extinction talks. And so I just went. And like, so that, I think that was one of the first things that like, they were doing these public talks, they were doing them all over the country, it felt like accessible. So I went and it really did blow me away, this kind of talk. And, um, and then like, I signed up, like, so it was just became, it was something that was just like really accessible. Um, and then a couple of weeks later, I was throwing blood over, over Downing Street, you know, and, um, and then just got taken away on this kind of like whirlwind. A few weeks after that, I was like, I dropped, I was involved in the team that dropped the BMX ramp off on, on Waterloo Bridge. Um, and yeah, and so I was just involved, but just on another level, I think there's this idea that activism in the past had been like, like for instance, like Greenpeace on a boat in the North Sea. So it was that group over there doing that thing to somebody else. And there was this idea that, you know, it didn't involve me. And I think like I tapped into it subconsciously at the time, but since I've learned about it, that this idea of blocking bridges and getting involved and 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 stopping the city, it it was actually making people become aware that this was a problem that was really affecting them. So it wasn't this case of like patronising people of thinking like this is a problem over there that doesn't concern you. This is a problem that concerns all of us. And by like taking the actions that XR were, it kind of like. Um, yeah, really like consolidated this idea that it's actually our responsibility, that the government have failed us. And now that it's, our, you know, we have to kind of take responsibility for, for ourselves. And although I've learned about all this since, I think subconsciously that's what attracted me to Extinction Rebellion at the start. And I think that's why um, it's become, as, it became as successful as it did, like, before April and then and then post April I think that was that was one of the reasons. Thanks so much Liam um, I've just had a message here to remind all the viewers that you can post questions in the in the chat whatever uh, medium you're watching this on okay so let's go on to Sarah Zoltash you can um, go on from those points what do you think uh, gives it's this? So it's so fantastic to hear about the that the way that XR was so accessible because my um, work in the arts, in performance art, live art, theatre, music, I've been radicalised by how unjust it is when you're working in a system that's exploiting you all the time. And so for me, side going, doing a sidestep from how um, like the injustices in working in the arts into the injustices of like the climate movement and other social movements was just obvious. And I felt like my whole life was just drenched in trying to bring about change. And the thing that was so challenging all the time was that it wasn't accessible, that it required a lifestyle change, which a lot of people are just are not willing to undergo. And I feel like what XR was able to do was like ride an accessible surfboard over this wave of consciousness transformation that had just been like swelling and swelling and swelling with the rising of like women's movements and Black Lives Matter and an awareness of like the need for a different financial system, what came out of Occupy, you know, all of this was just like the way that all of the marches that had been happening um, about Brexit, about Trump, you know, doesn't matter how many people were getting out on the streets, it wasn't doing anything. The activists who were like hardened were just, it 
it was just exhausting and XR was able to like yeah have this have a really clear message that said it doesn't matter whether you've got dreadlocks in your hair or if you play a bongo drum it's not about that we just need you because your government is failing you and um, so it's just really heartening to hear your story Liam it's the first time we met and I'm really glad. <laughs> Thanks Sarah that's really really nice and um and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think it's that thing of we need people, right? And we still need people. We need many, many more people. So I've got a little question for you all later about that. But um, okay, let's, uh, let's move on. So George Marshall, um, this one's really for you. How can Extinction Rebellion broaden its appeal to reach climate deniers, Tory voters, some of those are environmentalists too, by the way, um, and those who have a deep resentment of all things activist? I wouldn't uh, assume that Tory voters aren't supporting XR or aren't in there at the moment. Uh, there's never been anything in climate change that said that it was a left-wing issue or a right-wing issue. It, it should be something which is across the board. I think the um, I, I think the, the, there's a whole lot of reasons why it's become politically polarised, but um, it, that should never have happened. And early on in the piece, of course, you know, like right back in the the late 80s, early 90s, it wasn't polarised. That's something which has developed over time. Um, I think it's really, I think it's really, really important that we have a, a you know, a, a broad-based um, mandate on this, you know, that we have a, that we have a wide range of people involved. I mean, one of the questions is, well, do we need to engage wider? Like, do we need to bring more people on board? And, um, you know, maybe we can just do this ourselves, you know, and there's that quote we all know, which Supposedly Margaret Mead said it, but actually she didn't, where you say, well, you know, what we need in the world is for small groups of people to get together. It's the only thing that changes the world. Well, actually, that's not true. It's large groups of people. <laughs> and also, um, you can't just change things by getting like minded people together. I don't think climate change can change like that. So do we need to reach more people? Yes. The question is whether XR should be doing it. I guess that's the question. Like, is XR the vehicle for reaching wider audiences? And going wider, and I think I think Exile can do that. I think Exile already does that because it has it has an authenticity which works across the board. So, you know, it does. People aren't doing it for the money; they're doing it because they care passionately about it. And 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 I think that authenticity or being prepared to take risks and and do things which might be personally challenging because you really care about something appeals to people of all politics. Um, I think the way that so I think XR should. And I think diversity, there's a lot of issues, I think, for environmental movement as a whole with diversity. It's got far too many people like me, of kind of middle-aged white posh men in it. Um, and I think, you know, it all needs to broaden out. But I think the diversity we often forget is a political diversity, um, that there's people right across the board um, of all kinds who have different political values. And I think they should be reached out to, not deniers, I, I don't know. I mean, people who outright don't think climate change is a problem, well, or don't don't think it exists, well, let them do their own thing. I wouldn't even bother with them. But there's a whole lot of people in the middle who go, yeah, yeah, it's a bit of a problem. I'm a bit concerned. But I've got other things on my mind, and it's somewhere down the line. It's somewhere in the future, and I recycle my plastic bags. And you know, but, but we have to reach those people and say, no, this is really important, and so we need to do it now. And I want to hear from other people on the panel. But I mean, I guess some ideas I'd put out there about how that might be possible. I'd say a lot of what XR is doing at the moment is actually pretty good. Uh, it's it's being very uh, real and authentic and open. I think it needs to be careful that it doesn't become too clearly identified with one uh, set of political values over and above another. And I guess that's really challenging. It's going to be very challenging for people who want to make it strongly intersectional and bring in a lot of wider struggles. And I think I think. Personally, I would advise not to do that, of keeping that debate going internally and bringing in different points of view, but keeping open to a wider range. And I think really, really important, get a range of different kinds of spokespeople involved. Like um, the, the, big, the big thing that would really swing wider would be getting in people who are not who you would expect. So getting, getting people on the media or wider spokespeople who, you know, might be, might be older, might be more conservative, might be... Um, might come from different kinds of backgrounds you know like find somebody find somebody in your ranks who's a you know a former airline pilot or <laughs> somehow comes from somewhere that you would not expect and put those people forward and give them the foreground i guess the final thing is actually for everybody in xr to be thinking that they have a personal power to make change around them 
by the conversations they have with their friends and their family, and everybody's locked up with family at the moment, um, the conversations they might have with workmates, being able to reach wider into networks and speak to people who might not be the people they might normally speak to. And um, I think when we move forward into more activist phase, actively recruiting people from different kinds of backgrounds to come along and get involved, and supporting and nurturing them to do that. Can I pick up what George is saying there about XR being broad based? I think it's so important. I think it's so important that we are appealing across classes and that we're appealing across different political values. And that's why we like to say in XR that we are beyond party politics and beyond ideology, that this is an emergency and the nature of the emergency changes everything. It means that normal rules of engagement, as it were, are suspended. Uh, and I think that does make it possible for XR to have a really wide appeal. At the same time, I think George is right that there are likely to be limitations to XR's appeal, at least so long as it can't involve people who are really quite unexpected. Something which I think could be really quite significant, which was going to be launching but then got <laughs> scuppered by the coronavirus, is Chris Packham's wildlife rebellion. Uh, which I've been working on him and his colleagues uh, on a bit. And I think that's really exciting because that could bring in quite a lot of people, people like bird watchers and various kinds of people who, who uh, may be a bit nerdy, maybe a bit uh, non-social, maybe a bit uh, conservative. Um, and I think uh, Chris has a great plan to try to bring in a load of those people who might find it difficult to identify with XR, but, but Wildlife Rebellion could attract them. I think that's really a significant possibility that we should be looking for as we go forward. One more thing, I think that this coronavirus crisis will give us new potentialities for alliance building. I think there's going to be a huge amount of anger in the coming weeks and months when more and more people in this country wake up to how devastatingly poorly our government has handled this crisis compared to other governments. Uh, and there's going to be crucial questions about how we rebuild uh, this society, how we rebuild, rebuild the economy, etc., from out of this contraction that we've caused to protect the vulnerable over the past several weeks. And those questions are exactly the kind of questions that XR needs to be in on. But there's going to be, as I say, a much wider range of people who I think are going to be, want to be in on those questions too. I think it's the uh, an exciting time of possibilities for alliance building coming up now. And if I could add to that, I think that coronavirus will create an atmosphere whereby the sense of togetherness, that there are issues which are transcendental issues, transcendental issues which go much wider than party politics or class or background or attitudes, but actually affect all of us. And the sense that people can all pull together and work together because the most effective language for bringing in wider audiences to talk is to talk about climate change as something around togetherness within which everybody can make a contribution. Yeah, agreed. If I can just say that something about what you both said about people and what we can expect of people, if there's anything that XR has shown us is that you really, no one is who you expect they are when it comes to this emergency. People are willing to shift out of their like received identities in order to do things that maybe might seem extraordinary to us and certainly seem extraordinary to them. And when you say about um, how we rebuild and our relationship to the vulnerable, maybe it's those very vulnerable people who can show us the strength that we need in this time. I'm always wary about when we move from a place of expectation, we end up often being um, disappointed or surprised and to prepare ourselves for um, the impossible and the unknown because that is really the lesson of April isn't it that the um that the impossible and what we thought wasn't possible actually did unfold yeah yeah brilliant thanks Sarah um so I'm going to bring in Sarah Lunnan next um because following on from from that question about having a a broad appeal we've we've got something else that we wanted to just touch on so what about the deflectors Sarah you know those people that they think well they go well you know i I recycle and stuff, you know, and like walk to school sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, and that's good, right? My kids don't like plastic anymore. So we're going in the right direction. What do you, what do, you do with those people? Because they almost, they almost feel like they've done something without doing something, right? So George did touch on this a, uh, a little bit. So yeah, it's, it's the idea that I know there's a problem, 
but you know I've given up using plastic straws I, I do my recycling and I'm thinking of buying an electric car so every everything's going to be all right you know and actually thanks very much Extinction Rebellion I really like what you're doing and all those other groups you're doing a great job I really support you and you know keep keep going as if somehow we've got this you know that it's it's going to be all right because Extinction Rebellion exists and we're causing mass disruption so everything's going to be okay so it, that is a really it, it it's really difficult getting to those people because it's a it's not quite a form of denial but it's a way of not exposing yourself to the truth because you know the very real uncomfortable truth is that we have to make major changes to all of our lives and and our lifestyles and I mean that that's the thing that happened so wonderfully in April and uh, Roger's uh, famous quote of we're fucked as well to actually for an environmental group to come out and say this is how bad it is it's really really terrible so I think we have to keep telling that really uncompromising truth you know that no we haven't got this it things have not got any better yet yeah, you know we've changed the conversation but we haven't done what we needed to do and to also keep putting it out to people that it needs you to join in as well. You, this is not something that you can be a spectator in or support from the sidelines. If you understand it and you support it, you need to come and join us. And it's, you know, George talked about having conversations. It is a difficult conversation to, to have with people. Uh, and, you know, if, if I knew the answer to it, I wouldn't I wouldn't have spent the last you know 15 or 20 years as a as a local politician and, and as a campaign and if we knew the answer we wouldn't be where we are now but I think we do have to keep asking that question and and I think one of the things that COVID-19 has shown us is, is that a global crisis that, and what we're talking about with the uh, with the emergency of our natural world ultimately the go the global crisis the end of the world problems end up being with the being the same as the end of the month problems and we're all well I'm certainly concerned about that now we are concerned about that and it's the same thing we have to start making those links and I think that's one of the things that, that will help move people to that level of realization yeah thanks Sarah you just made me feel really nostalgic because that 50 meter long climate change we're fucked banner I just made on the floor of this room that I'm in now <laughs> You had to unroll a bit and then roll a bit and glue the letters, roll a bit. It took a very long time. Anyway, um, those are the days. Um, okay, so uh, so let's let's think a little bit more about April. I'm going to go to you, Sarah Zoltash. Um, what happened uh, over the days in the April Rebellion in 2019 that's most deeply lodged in your memory? Oh wow! Um, it to pick one, I guess. Just to begin with the atmosphere, this atmosphere of like incredible possibility. I'd always, um, you know, I'm somebody who's worked at festivals since I was a teenager and I associate that level of collective effervescence, this sense of absolute liberation and possibility with an environment, you know, that's like contained off and you've paid a ticket to get in there. And to feel that on the streets of central London, to be able to cycle with your arms open, singing at the top of your lungs down the middle of Oxford Circus was like, just, just absolutely incredible. You would see somebody across, like across Oxford Circus, across the like five, four lanes, whatever it is, and you'd go, "All right, mate, how's it going?" You'd actually have space to be able to interact with people on the streets. And in terms of like the big, strong, um, like there's there's so many moments of that togetherness and that coming together that really stay with me. I remember this like realization on the first night that unless we stayed with the five different sites unless people stayed there like okay yeah it's fun to arrive and set up the stuff and congratulate yourself on how beautiful it is but wow we actually have to stay here and I remember like the messages and the calls that would go around saying this site needs people this site needs the rest of us and the way that people just like you would become friends because you were shoulder to shoulder just like running to support other people that you just met that you just kind of fallen in love with in the middle of all of that um, yeah, there's one one really, really strong moment for me that um, came sort of somewhat later on in the as as it all unfolded, which was when the pink boat after it being like this center of like rave and joy and like speeches and possibilities and arrests. And it was like this um, like this you know, pulsing um, center 
Well, when the pink boat had to be taken away and it was released and it was in some ways sacrificed by the rebels, Gail Bradbrook gave an amazing speech where she said, you know, we will have to lose things. And the way that we lose things will be the making of us. It shows us who we are. And rebels gathered. And as the police kind of flanked this boat that was being taken down Regent Street, down Oxford Street, down, down Regent Street, they were there all in their high bit viz. And rebels led by an incredible rebel called April Grief Song just sang a wailing, keening song that comes from Scotland in their grief of having to lose the pink boat and everything that the pink boat symbolised. And that, for me, along with so many other moments, was this um, spontaneous outpouring of human spiritual expression. Like, I don't mean spirit in terms of like, yes, all of the different religious organisers. Yeah, wonderful. I love that people pray. I mean, you know that about me. I love that people pray. But to see people do that, the way that the birds sing at dawn, you know, it's not about someone telling you what to do. It's about this thing is being taken from us. So let's let's process. Let's offer our voices. Let's mark this moment as something meaningful and symbolic. It's I've just got goosebumps thinking about it. It's like it's, it was many of those moments, people's outpourings of songs, songs of devotion to, you know, Mother Earth, this moment that we're in the emergency Greta, like everything, um, like the way that people came together in ecstasy and joy and care for each other. Um, that that that's what that that's what left this great impression on me that like hang on a minute all of this time that people have been saying um, oh yeah you're never going to be able to do that like that's a utopic idea like those things that you think you want that's not realistic come on come back down to earth it's like actually pe people do know how to move with love if you give them the chance and that was really what we did in April we just moved with love and it <laughs> inspired the whole world and um, yeah yeah, amazing. Okay, let's take in Rupert because I can see that he wants to make a comment about April as well. Yeah, so I think Sarah's just told us something really significant about how and why April worked. I want to add in a, a different dimension, a, a more sort of political or analy analytical dimension, which is that I think what was absolutely crucial was the fact that, as Sarah said, we held those sites. So in the first couple of days of the rebellion, there was a huge sort of upsurge, really, of media opposition and public opposition to what we were doing. And people were like, this is outrageous. You know, like Liam was saying earlier, you're just blocking these bridges, you're blocking these, these streets. You can't do this. But the fact was that we carried on doing it. And by doing that, we created, by the fact that we lasted, we created a sort of artificial temporary emergency or an artificial disaster. And that forced a conversation and it forced people to come back again and again to thinking about it. And I think that was crucial to how the rebellion worked because what happened as I read the situation was that over the course of the first week, attitudes started to soften a bit and people started saying things like, and some people in the media started saying things like, well, you know, you've got to at least admire their, their determination. And, you know, well, why are they so determined? You know, why do they, why are they so fanatical as to keep on staying, standing in these streets day after day, being arrested day after day and so on. And then by the time we got to the second week of the rebellion, we were still there. The atmosphere had changed further. And a lot of people were starting to say, and including people in the establishment were starting to say, you know what, it is high time that we really did address this emergency. And the, the kind of miniature artificial emergency that we had created, created the possibility for really thinking about and starting to get serious about you know the real emergency which was the reason why we were there in the first place and that I think is what led into the possibility of us having the meetings with the politicians and the government and so on which happened in the following week which me and Sarah were uh, involved in um, and that led to the parliament declaring the climate and environment emergency uh, after we had had those meetings. I think it was our persistence in our creation of that temporary artificial disaster or emergency that did that, that by forcing that national conversation. And something which is interesting about what we're going through now with the coronavirus, of course, is that this is a, a spontaneous, um, unplanned, uh, worldwide uh, emergency, creating a huge sense of more or less shared vulnerability. Um, and that, I think, gives the possibility for the kind of thing that we've been trying to evoke in these rebellions to go a lot wider and a lot bigger. If we can get people to move in their heads over the coming months from Corona 
to climate from this short emergency to a longer and more permanent emergency, which is going to be even bigger and more terrible, well, then that will be us really, really doing our job. And that is a, an enormous possibility, which I think is going to become present in 2020 and 2021. Brilliant. Thanks, Rupert. Yeah, what you were just saying there reminded me a bit of um, just uh, before Extinction Rebellion existed, I was doing some air pollution campaigning in central London and we we blocked a road off and there were several members of XR in the in the team back in those days. Uh, and uh, we came we came on and off the road, on, off, on, off, on, off for about an hour around uh, Marble Arch, I think it was. And um, a police officer, uh, a, a lady police officer said to me, well, um, you know, I, I suppose it's not that bad because you keep letting some traffic through. So you're not being that bad. And, and myself and my friend Liam said, you know, I mean, the suffragettes smashed almost every single window on Oxford Street. And I wish I had had her body cam footage because she just turned around to me and went, yeah, I mean, nothing happens unless you make a fuss, does it? So good luck. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, you know, people do get it. So I just want to ask you, Liam, quickly, as someone who's definitely got less sort of uh, history in the environmental movement and that space, on, on that topic of like justified disruption and people accepting the work that we do, what, how do you feel like the sort of public mood or the, or the opinion of people that you know has changed about causing disruption or doing civil disobedience? I think you're on mute, Liam. <laughs> Classic Zoom. <laughs> Isn't there someone to do that for me? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think um, I think what we did um, <clears throat> is uh, what we managed to do during April is like there was that idea of the Overton window, so we changed what was acceptable in public conversation and public discourse and that was definitely changed so people like that I that I that I go to work with um became aware at least that that there was this kind of idea of um this emergency kind of messaging um was being discussed um and that was being talked about um but I, I still think there's a that there's 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 still loads of work to do like like you were saying earlier like those people that say that think that you know they're doing their bit I seem to remember and I was thinking about this the other day with regards to um when so on the last day of the boat on the Saturday was the day that I that I got arrested and we were doing swarming or uh, just kind of like outside Oxford Circus and I seem to remember there was like a those electric cabs had just come out the new electric cabs and there is the and and the the cab driver when he come through the swarm through the block he went I you know I've just paid 60 grand for this I'm doing my bit um and there is that idea and there and it and it is like what Sarah Lunnan was saying earlier about this this idea that if we just like buy differently or we buy the electric cars or you know, we recycle that that we're somehow kind of like going to get over this crisis and we can continue living the way we are. Um, yeah, I, I think there's loads and loads of work to do on that. And that's like from the from the media. I mean, I, I hear like on the Today programme the other day, they're talking about like pensions in like 60 years time. It's like it's, it's complete lunacy. It's like you're living in a completely different dimension. It's like they're talking about pension policy over the next 50 to 60 years. And it's like, there aren't going to be, pen, there aren't going to be, you know, this is going to be a completely different world in 60 years time. You're not going to be worried about pensions. You know what I mean? So it's like, there's like, we're, we're kind of experiencing this kind of like alternate reality. And when you're kind of aware of the climate crisis, like many of us are, and, and many of us in the movement, you can like, be just it's just like enough to send you crazy because you're like why why are people talking about this stuff it like it feels like completely irrelevant what we need to be talking about is like revolutionizing how we kind of live our lives and what we consume and and with regards to um yeah i mean maybe we're going to talk about this a little bit more later but how um you know that there's this idea at the moment that people some people in xr are a little bit uncomfortable about the covid crisis um, being discussed by us but it's like 
it's all part of this kind of we need to start looking at it as in like the whole like there's a whole problem and and this is and 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 basically what it boils down to is like other people have discussed is like how the economy is basically the economic systems that of how we operate globally is kind of like affecting the the climate ultimately but then also how how we can respond as a society to crisis and this covid crisis is also like showing that we can't cope particularly we can't cope at all well to crisis um yeah so i think there's there's to answer your question in short i think there's there's lots of work that needs to be done to 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 explain to people that the current kind of like trajectory that we are on is like not it, it's not sustainable and 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 i think that's connected with the climate crisis but it's also connected to all other kinds of different areas where we're having this pub public debate about like i said like pensions and all these kinds of ideas that they they it's 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 not it's not real because these things aren't aren't really what matters right now what matters now is is the emergency and the and the catastrophe that we kind of all have to come together as a society and work out how we're going to deal with that so yeah there's <laughs> to answer your question i think there's there's still load, lots to do basically thanks liam i'm just going to take a little extra add on point from sarah zoltash and then i'm going to move on to take some of these uh, audience questions go on sarah Thanks so much. Yes, when you mentioned about the COVID crisis and how it like teaches us, it can teach us so much about the response to crisis and the response to like being asked to change. Like I've um, like lots of um, lots of my friends are involved in the rebellion and variously involved with um, calling for change, systems change all across the different systems and sectors that we exist within. And yet, when COVID was like when the news about potential lockdown was coming in, when when we went before the lockdown was instated and people were having to make their own personal choices, lots of people I know who are involved in incredible change making projects who were going to have to they themselves stop their own business as usual, didn't want to, went into a denial. I'm not going to get it. It's not going to affect me. Why do I have to do it? My body's young. You know, there was like, and it was interesting to me. I have a vulnerable body uh, because I've had a long term illness. And so for me, I had to immediate, I had to really look after myself. And it was like, it was, it was a real lesson in compassion and humility to me to see um, that people who in all other walks of life are demanding that others change, they themselves find it so hard to face a reality that they're not prepared for, that they don't want, that upsets um, work that they've been preparing sometimes for months, sometimes for years. You know, if you've got a big show or a big project landing and you're told, no, it's not gonna happen. If you've got a big pension pot that you've been doing a research on for like 10 years or something, and someone comes along and is like not nah, change all of that you're like oh, I've been this is my thing I've been making this thing you know I don't want to not do my thing and it really showed it yeah it really showed me that um that there's like this there's a there's a kind of um some compassion work that ne that needs to come into play so that those people are really held and noticed and known and acknowledged for all that they need to sacrifice you know all that needs to be lost in order for the bigger game to be won yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I remember uh, speaking with um, various people over the course of the Extinction Rebellion kind of journey about the difficulty that you can often have with sustainability experts, in quotes, because, you know, in, in some cases, they're, they're sort of realising that their work is, it's just not enough, you know, and that they've got a they've got a trajectory and a career and everything's mapped out for them. But it's obviously no good in the face of um, uh, how bad we've let this situation get. Okay, um, I'm going to just look at the audience questions. So we've got loads of good questions coming in. And um, there's a really good one here for you, George, uh, from somebody called Todd Smith on YouTube. He says, hi, panel. I'm an airline pilot. <laughs> <laughs> starting pilots for XR today. Um, no, it didn't say that. How can the movement appeal more to my industry and assure pilots that we don't that we don't want to destroy their livelihoods and we're just pushing, we are pushing for a just transition. So perhaps you can speak to that. How do you appeal to those people? How do you comfort them, George? And then how do you also argue realistically for a just transition for airline pilots? <laughs> Oh my God! Uh, don't put me on the spot, will you? No um, pressure. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm going to want some help from the panel on this one. But look, I'd say one of the things that one of the things that you start doing with 
a conversation with any group, whether they're airline pilots or whether they're coal miners or whether they're people working in the oil industry, is you start by recognizing that this is hard and challenging, but they're people, uh, but they're people who are decent people, they're doing a job, they're looking after their families. And I think start from a position of respect for people as people. And I think in many cases also respecting that they have performed a, an important social value. Um, but of course, now we're in a situation where we know that things are going to have to change. So I think one of the things is to reach out to people and say, look, be partners in this change. Right? You need to be you need to be participating in this. Um, I think there's got to be some, I think for airline pilots, I think in, uh, across the board, there's got to be some very straight and honest speaking. You know, we're not we're not going to find some technology where we can suddenly start having jet planes buzzing about running on running on batteries or, God forbid, running on. Um, you know, um, palm oil. You know, there's some like nightmare stuff floating around in the field of uh, of biofuels, and just saying, look, actually, this is going to have to mean a contraction of the industry and a substantial one. And that's the simple truth of it. But I think, I think, recognizing that, but also involving people in the conversation, and I think also part of a just transition is saying, look, if jobs are going to be lost, let's all talk together about how we can find a safer landing for you so that you're not completely bereft of your livelihood, but actually that there's a way that you can that you can land, that you can reskill, that you can retool. But airline airlines are a very particular one, aren't they? Because um they there there are very few there are very few technological options in terms of, of jet travel. It's largely ignored from international negotiations, as we know, because it's somehow um, it's has very cleverly managed to, to sidestep. And as we know from all of the figures, we are never going to be able to achieve any kind of reasonable climate change targets whilst we have aviation expanding out of control. I think the starting point that I'd like the aviation pilots to say is to say we want to see a global moratorium. Like we want to see we want to see a stop. So that's what I would really ask airline pilots to do. Say, look, we cannot keep expanding regardless of what happens with, with technology. No more airports, no more expansion on aviations. Let's have a lid. Because my view is that starting from a position of saying let's, let's cap is a position where you can actually then start to have a level conversation. So, you know, similar things with people in the oil industry, right? No more oil exploration, no more development of new resources. Let's start with the cap and then let's talk about the decline from there. But I want to hear other views here because airline pilots, boy. But, but yeah, but by the way, I love the fact that someone is doing that. And I really welcome you being part of a conversation. Thanks. And a brave thing to do. Yeah, thank, you, thanks, massive thanks to Todd Smith for sending this in. Yeah. I'm just going to take Sarah London because I know that you just had a point and then something, comment from Rupert as well. Oh, so George is talking about um, partnership. Yes, that you, you know, that ex Extinction Rebellion, we, we're not out to get anybody and we haven't ever said as XR that your industry, this cannot happen, this should not be, you need to do this. What we've done, interestingly, is laid out the extent of the problem. We've laid it out. And I think what um, then makes people feel uncomfortable, and I really, you know, I do empathize with Todd a lot, but if you look at the extent of the problem and you're an airline pilot, you know, all of a sudden it's actually coming home to you that the industry that is providing your livelihood is ultimately going to be the one which is going to kill your children. And that, you know, that's really, really uncomfortable, isn't it? You know, the fuel that I'm putting in my car is actually um, powering the, the, the collapse of the life support system that my children are going to need. We're all facing these issues. We're not telling people what to do, but we are bringing them to, to people's view. And I think that's, that's the real beauty of, of, the, of the third demand is to say, we need a different kind of democracy to find these solutions. Of course, nobody should end up destitute because we need to change the industry and we need to change our economy, but we are wealthy. We have all this natural wealth. How do we use it for planetary repair and to protect the people? And that's the, you know, that's the beauty of the Citizens Assembly. So, you know, I'd say to Todd, come and join Extinction Rebellion. You know, you need to join us. We need you as much as you need us. And we do need that just transition. Yeah, that's beautifully put, Sarah. And I'd just add to that, that the term just transition, which Todd used, that is the key. That's the key. Uh, and it should begin now. 
right? Uh, so I live in Norwich and normally my life is blighted by these bloody you know, planes uh, taking off from Norwich airport morning, noon and night. Um, well, not at the moment. Uh, it's, it's a lot more pleasant and, uh, and quiet in the sky because we've stopped most of those planes because of this crisis, which was of course partly caused by those planes in the first place, taking the virus all over the globe at, uh, at the speed of, a, of jet travel. Um, it ought to start now, the just transition ought to start now. Th this pause is a perfect moment for us to think together about how we want to build a, a better world for the long term. Just that. Great, thanks so much, Rupert. Um, okay, let's go on to another question here. I've got... Um, a message from Pauline on Facebook. Um, Pauline says, uh, some people just don't join things. I have close friends and neighbors who understand the science and the urgency, but see activism as so far off from their life script that they seem to politely and passively observe. How can we help them to join? So, any, any takers for that question? I don't actually know who to direct that to. Oh, me, pick me. Sarah, okay, let's go Sarah. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd say to Pauline, um, if they're an absolute lost cause, go and spend your energies on somebody else who's more interested and get them to join. Because, you know, some people, it just, they have to know that everybody's on that boat before they're going to join it. And so if it's really, really hard work, go, go and find an easier case and go and talk to some people who, who are more interested in joining you. I feel like an agony aunt now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take a comment from Rupert and then let's hear from George as well, because uh, it's kind of your area talking to people that aren't convinced yet, George. Well, I just wanted to make a technical point about Extinction Rebellion, which is that we're not a membership organization. So nobody has to join. You can just turn up to a talk, you can turn up to an event, you can turn up to do an action, yeah. and then you can just not turn up uh, for a long time. So uh, yeah, just dip in and dip out. Uh, and, uh, and anyone who wants to join in with anything, you don't have to sign anything, you don't have to pay any money, take it or leave it as you wish. Yeah, George? I, I wanna say don't, don't think of any conversation or any interaction with people as not being worthwhile. I mean, obviously what you do is you, you invest your primary resources in the places where you can get the biggest gains, so you don't put a lot into that. But, you know, you don't, we, in climate outreach, we've done a lot of work on studying the dynamics of conversations. And one of the things from that is you just don't know what effect you're having with a conversation. People might push back, they might react, they might pretend not to be interested. I mean, we all know in our own lives, conversations we've had, which have really changed our lives. And sometimes they just plant a seed and you don't know where it's going to go. So I would say, um, treat those conversations with a wide range of people as being part of your activism, as part of the way you make change in the world. It's been part of a thing which has changed our attitudes toward gender and sexual orientation and racism has been little conversations of people saying, this is what I think, or this is what I care about, or that's not funny, or that's racist, or just little things here and there. So don't, you know, don't put a huge amount into it, but recognize and try in every way to have conversations with people on the edge of your normal social circle and just yeah just plant the seed just let it go don't push it too hard either just say okay and i think i think something that is really important for us as activists is that in our interactions with people we we show a kind of um joy and uh and the thrill of what we're doing, the joy of what we're doing, the sense of kind of being honest with the world, and we just show that. So I guess like a bit like Rupert was saying, like we're not we're not proselytizing, we're necessarily trying to trying to recruit people. What we're trying to do is to say, actually, where we are is great. Come on, come on over here, and if they want to join us, they will. Yeah, go on. On the topic of joy and being loving, being alive, Sarah Zoltash. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, actually, the uh, actually it's coming from quite a like poignant place I guess because I'm used to hearing things like you know some people just don't join things some people don't want to join in and um, with the work that regenerative cultures does within the rebellion regenerative cultures I'm sure that people watching know but it's this idea that you know part of the reason we're in this crisis is because we've come apart 
as culture we've stopped we've become degenerative we've started to kind of like separate out and isolate ourselves isolate ourselves from the natural world from each other from the greater conversation because instead the things that we identify with are sold to us you know your holiday your job your car that kind of thing not to condemn anyone who's in that I'm in that you know but just um when I heard that it, it like panged something in me that um reminded me that we're in a crisis of belonging as well like what do we belong to if we don't belong to the job the mortgage the family the thing that I've been working towards what what am I and like whilst I'm not saying uh, well whilst I don't you know no one has to join anything I'm actually a bit of a hermit for all of this like joyful life living that I do I tend to just like sit in my my perch reading and and getting on with stuff but um like I know that for me belonging is a really important piece and it's I don't need to go and necessarily join a thing in order to understand what I belong to I can talk to my family I can look around at the things that I hold dear and just begin there you know just rather than sort of like have to step out and go out of my comfort zone just be like okay well like how about this is this participating in the truth that I want to live um and yeah, just to recognizing that that crisis of belonging also is part of the climate crisis, the, the mental health crisis, the intergenerational crisis that we're seeing in this like great relief in like the we, we, we we're able to see the way that the generations have fallen apart in um, the societies that we live in because we're unable to care for the ones that we love. We're all like atomized. Um, and so when I hear, you know, some people just don't want to join things, I say, well, maybe that's not something to take for granted. You know, maybe that's also something that we can choose into and say is this what I want is this how I want to live is this the life that I want to offer to, to the ones that come after me thanks Sarah I just want to let you all know that we've had a message back from um from Todd our favorite airline pilot in the world it says thanks very much guys uh for the input it's really useful I agree pilots need to accept that we may have to be re-educated uh into the uh green sectors but I guess that has to come from the government. Hashtag pilots of XR and a little <laughs> fist raised emoji. Um, thanks, Todd. I look forward to meeting you sometime uh, on the streets. I'm sure you'll recognize one of us anyway, uh, when you inevitably come and support next time we're out. Um, okay, so uh, let's go on and take a question that we've got here from Facebook from Jeannie. Um, the critical thing right now is HS2. It's a dark, dark time for HS2 in the last couple of days, isn't it? And um, and they say it's it's the destruction of our environment. Could XR do more to stop this ecocide? I think it's worth us just giving a bit of a like big up mass respect to um, Larch Maxi and all of the others who've been campaigning on HS2 and living up trees in isolation. Um, often... Uh, watching bailiffs breaking covid laws at the moment um and uh, and breaching wildlife laws and stuff like that so there's it's a, it's a it's a bad time for our for our woodlands but any takers for this what do you think we could do more about um on that topic of ecocide anybody i'll take rupert first yeah just a quick point about uh, the hs2 issue uh, I've been tweeting about this. I find it so outrageous that the government are pushing ahead with this right now, including with lack of physical distancing and everything. Uh, they they're making the lockdown last longer as a result. So we all have to stay locked down longer while they get on with destroying ecosystems and building this carbon intensive, uh, ridiculous uh, train system that is completely incompatible with with uh, the goals of, uh, of 2025 or even 2030 for carbon net zero and biodiversity loss net zero. So I think the question is very well taken. Um, we ought to do more uh, about it. I think what Larch and friends are doing is brilliant. I think if more people could join them, that'd be fantastic. And you know, sooner or later, if this carries on, there will have to be consideration of, uh, of whether or not we um, allow ourselves to be locked down while they uh, destroy uh, all this, uh, all this uh, beautiful nature, uh, and build this uh, this stupid carbon-heavy uh, train line. So yeah, I don't have a plan, but I think it's something that Extinction Rebellion needs to think about right now, uh, and we need to, at the very least, make a lot of noise about how outrageous this is and about how they're going to be causing more people to die of uh, of coronavirus and keeping us locked down. For longer so they can build this this stupid rain, train system 
Great, thanks, Rupert. And then um, I just want to pull somebody in who can give a bit more uh, light for the viewers on why HS2 is bad, because I know that it's um, it's a confusing topic for some people, why environmentalists would campaign against um, against a new train line. So, um, I mean, I know Sarah London, you probably got some of the answers on that. Do you want to explain? So, um, fundamentally, there's a number of issues associated with HS2. One is an issue of how much it's actually going to cost. So the resources that we're going to pour into, into HS2, including the amount of carbon it, that, that we're going to um, use as our carbon budget that we're going to take to develop HS2, could actually be being used to develop much lower carbon infrastructure. So, for example, um, it could be being used to electrify the train systems we already have. It could be being used to uh, upgrade the train systems we already have so we can have more trains, for example, traveling down each train track by changing the, the point system. Um, and ultimately, when you do the equations on HS2 as to how much carbon it uses, it ends up being a very carbon heavy infrastructure. It's very energy intensive to move people really fastly, really fast across the countryside. So the carbon costs and the energy costs uh, to shave 20 minutes off a journey to Birmingham are simply not worth it. So, for example, the amount of money it's going to cost for HS2, we can actually build cycle tracks on every single major road and, and kind of um, networking road, if you like. So those roads between villages, between towns, we could have an off-road cycle system, you know, that we would start actually catching up with the Netherlands. So for example, our children could cycle along the roads and we would actually free a whole generation of children to actually be able to move around our cities and villages. So it, it's the actual cost of it itself and it's also the cost of what we lose by investing in HS2. Brief overview. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, I mean, who knows if the uh, the magic money tree that the Tories have just found might be in one of those ancient woodlands. They could accidentally chop it down, couldn't they? Um, that would be a disaster. Um, so, okay. <laughs> can, I, can I come back on it as well? Just to say that also there's, there's an issue that says if you look at every major development, every development the government takes from now on in terms of um, the, uh, the Paris Agreement and also in terms of our biodiversity, that we should be asking the question, does, does this development aid planetary repair? Is it repairing our planet and making the world better? And if the answer is no, then we shouldn't be doing it. So it is really simple, you know, my, my, the ch our children can do it. Does this help cutting down ancient woodland to make our lives better and to restore the natural world? I, I'd say not. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> um, brilliant. OK, there's a name here I recognise. Alfie uh, on Facebook has sent us a message. I'm going to give this to you, Liam. Um, going forward, do you think repeating tactics that we've used so far might be difficult? And what direction, as in actions, do you think we should head in? I think that blocking roads, etc., might not work. You're on mute again, Liam. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So I've been thinking what what I've been thinking quite a lot about what we should be doing um, going forward. So I've been thinking. So I mean, I know it's conversations that lots of people are having at the moment. So on a personal level, so basically, what I think is a good idea. We don't know how long this lockdown is going to be in place. We don't know if once we're released, whether they're going to actually, it's going to be a process of letting us out and then locking back down. We kind of don't really know how it's going to go yet. So it's quite difficult to plan stuff. But I do think that what we should be thinking about massively at the moment is this idea of debt and that the best thing that we can be doing um, as a society right now, if we've got an issue with this government, is starting to think about um, the kind of injustice of, of, of debt. So for instance, I rang the bank up, I've got a loan, right? And I rang them up the other day because they basically, when the COVID lockdown happened, they said, don't get in touch with us. Um, you know, we're, uh, we're really busy. So we're going to sort everything out for you. So I didn't get in touch with them. Then they sent me emails about, you know, um, we're cancelling your overdraft payments and all the rest of it. But I needed to talk to them about a loan. So they didn't get in touch with me about it. So I rang them 
the other day. And basically, um, because I wasn't within seven days um, of the payment coming out, they were going to take out the, the full payment for the loan and the loan holiday was going to, going to happen for the next three months afterwards. So I'm a self-employed electrician. I don't know when I'm going to go back to work again. And the bank feels like it's acceptable to take you know, £250 from me when I don't know when I'm going to be able to earn again. So it's like really unjust, right? So this is happening to tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people all over the country. So they're going to start to realise that this system is rigged against them. Okay, so there's this idea of, of justice. So I do think that if we can kind of get our heads around the campaign of like, um, because I do, uh, what I want to understand is from financial people is how many people, how many thousands of people would it take? So tens of thousands, for instance, to default on loans, to potentially go bankrupt, but in the kind of like political statement, uh, mass non repayment of debt, basically, to cause the financial industry to become nervous. So I think that's a real interesting idea that we can start to think about within Extinction Rebellion. Um, I do think we should still consider blocking roads, um, but I do have this idea that actually what's going to become more important in this sort of months is this idea of like inequality is going to be the real kind of like driving issue over the next six to 12 months. And what I think is that the idea almost that XR need to give this idea of rebellion away and, and it, for it to become like XR is just a movement of movements. And I almost feel like there needs to be like another Occupy needs to emerge where this idea of like the we are the 99%, they need to become a movement. This idea of like this economic system is not only driving kind of like us to like ecological destruction and extinction, but it's also kind of like deeply unfair on so many different levels and it's been going on for so many decades now that we're kind of like we're especially in the united kingdom we're, we're like unaware of it people in the global south aren't because they've been getting completely victimized by the imf and the world bank for so many years now that it's kind of like you know the the, the whole thing's sort of coming and the house of cards is coming starting to collapse that's for sure like they're starting to run out of options i saw the other day that the UK's debt in 2005 was at 500 billion. In 2010, it was at 1 trillion. It's now standing at 1.8 trillion pounds. So they're, they're running out of kind of cards to play, really. And I think like we should start to kind of understand that the economic system that we're living in is deeply connected to the climate crisis and also like how we, how our societies exist. So there's loads of um, things that we can think about going forward, but I do think, yeah, I don't, I do, I do think like XR can't be the only game in town. I think we need to come together um, with all kinds, of, and I do. That's why I think this movement of movements idea is kind of so important going forward. Um, yeah. Thanks, Liam. Okay, I'm a bit conscious of the time, so Rupert, just uh, let's try and try and go with brevity on the topic here. Yeah, well, I just want to briefly follow up what Liam's saying there. I think it was very powerful. Uh, I think that if we look back to last April, last April was, as I described earlier, as we've been talking about, a brilliant success. But I think it was kind of a one-off. And I think what we did in last October was a little bit too similar to what we did last April. And I've been arguing for some time that, as Liam says, we ought to be focusing more on the powerful, on the elites, on the finance industry, uh, on inequality. I think that's going to be more and more relevant in the post-corona uh, world. And I think there's something really important that XR can contribute to this, which is making sure that activism that targets insurance companies or the stock exchange or the super rich or London City Airport or so on is done in a way which isn't nasty, which isn't othering, uh, but which is instead done in a spirit of being broad-based and a spirit of... Uh, of love ultimately uh, and saying as a number of us have been saying on this call here this evening that this is about all of us and it's about all of our children so it's not that we're saying that, uh, that the rich uh, need to pay more taxes or whatever um, because we hate the rich it's that we're saying it because it's the only possible way forward there just isn't enough space in the atmosphere for everyone to have a private jet there just isn't enough um, uh, space in our um, financial budgets 
um, for, for, the, for the rich to keep having all the money that they have while we have a just transition, while we have a Green New Deal. The future is going to be more equal. It will either be more equal because in this spirit of love, we make it more equal, or it'll be more equal because society collapses and everyone will be scrabbling around in the dirt together. So let's hope we can still manage to make it the first and not the second of those scenarios. Thanks, Rupert. I had Sarah Zoltash, and then I'll just take one more comment from you, Sarah Lund. Thanks. The, um, I guess, again, speaking to this like repetition of strategies, of tactics, what I want to acknowledge is why people want to do the same thing again. But like, yes, partly it's because we succeeded. We saw that we succeeded. And so you think, OK, well, like do something once, do it again, see what happens. But also there's a hunger there for the liberation, for the success that those tactics gave. It's not just that I want to do this exact same thing again, but I want to feel free again. I want to feel powerful again. And one of the sad things for me um, in the time that, you know, within like a few days, I was living in London around um, the April rebellion and um, the immediate commodification of xr's messaging you know suddenly like you could like rent a rebel apartment luxury apartment you know you could like all these like different ways that you could become a rebel that were actually just commodification like more of the same culture that we were pushing against and it showed me how important it is to remember always that the rebellion isn't a cultural form you know it's not a festival it's not even really a protest it's something that we say this can't go on anymore and sometimes we do that by getting on the streets sometimes we do that by organizing a rent strike sometimes we do that by setting up a cryptocurrency or or a mutual aid group but either way each time we say no I withdraw my consent I don't want this there's a um, fantastic quote by a British playwright called Howard Barker that I adore which is that a carnival is not a revolution you know we don't want to throw all the pieces up in the air just so that we can have a party and then throw them all back down again and everything's the same we need this to change but at the same time I want to acknowledge those rebels who say please can we just have that joy again Please, can we get out on the streets again? I loved that. I met so many amazing people. I felt alive. And I want to acknowledge that and say, look, we're not trying to take that away from you by saying we need to change tactics. We hear you. It's just that in order to bring about the changes that we want to bring in, that's not going to work. And hey, if you want to feel togetherness, you want to feel like you get to see those rebels that you love, that's what we've got regen culture for. That's what we've got those communities for. So get involved with those. Thanks, Sarah. Go on, Sarah Lennon, last point. And it's just when I, I, I was listening to Rupert and I was reminded of a cartoon that went around um, a, a couple of weeks ago now, three, three weeks ago, when there was a great toilet roll crisis, uh, the, the March 2020 toilet roll crisis. And there was a couple of uh, cartoons going around going, if, if you're really cross at those selfish people hoarding all the toilet rolls, just wait till you find out all those selfish people who are hoarding all the money. You know, and it is, it, it, yes, it's like bloody brilliant. Yes, there you go. In the, 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 the toilet roll um, uh, econ economics explained via toilet rolls and it you just suddenly m makes it so unfair, you know, and I, I might, I do, might have some disagreements with Rupert around who and how we target and who and how we, we rebel um, and the level of disruption. But I do, I do agree that there is a kind of, there are some fundamental values around fairness and equity that, that we have to address to, to be able to have a world, and it comes back again to plant repair and a world that uh, allows us to protect ourselves. Thanks so much, Sarah. Okay, so um, I'm gonna ask you all for one last comment and it's gonna be, have to be very short because we're running out of time. It's, um, it's Thursday night, so I've been told to tell you all that we're going to finish and we're going to go and clap for the NHS, but I'm actually going to go and bash a saucepan for yeah. the NHS outside yeah. because I like it much more when it's really loud. <laughs> um, okay, so quick go round before I wrap this up, and it's moving on from what you've just said, Sarah. So I've done really well, I think, today to have a panel of people who have not literally just been talking about coronavirus for the entire time, but I did have a beautiful vision that my partner sort of told me uh, that I should have a think about last night, which is, do you imagine Oxford Circus uh, this time last year? And we were there and it was busy and it was joyful, it was beautiful and it was closed. And you imagine Oxford Circus today, it is also pretty much closed. 
the uh, complaint and the disagreement around the lost profits and the shops not, not getting their business and all of that stuff from this time last year is unbelievably radical impact that, that the COVID-19 crisis is having on us right now. And as activists, that's really, really difficult uh, when, when we feel we can't go out and meet face to face, we can't do loads of the stuff we normally do. So one sentence each, please. How do we remain radical in, um, during this lockdown? Sarah Zoltash first. I want to speak, I'm not, it, rather than going straight to the radical, to a commemorative meditation that's being offered from Exile, but just to the world at 9 p.m. next Tuesday, the 21st, which is the anniversary of the death of the incredible lawyer, Polly Higgins, who campaigned for laws about ecocide to be written into international law. To commemorate that, we're offering a candle meditation at 9 p.m. to remember all of those who are losing their lives to COVID. And to say that, as just as you so beautifully remembered how like a year can pass and yet we can come together in the same moment with focus and concentration and intention to say this matters to us and we're gonna do something, even if it's just a simple gesture, even like tonight with the NHS, these things are important. So 9 p.m. next week um, on, there's a Zoom call also on, on uh, recently set tv but you can also just light a candle and put it in your window and i'm going to be hosting a show on the live streams from 8 15 until 9 just before that speaking to some visionaries from the movement from tamara in portugal and also listen to the visions of the movement of rebels we're really keen to hear like what do you think is going to come like what do you want to come it's called vision seeds and it's a new show that's going to be starting next week so thank you thanks sarah george marshall how are we going to remain radical whilst we're in these difficult times? I think the most radical thing that people can do and the bravest thing is often to reach out to people who are not like themselves. So to reach across the divides. I think, as I said before, that this is a time when people are having a lot of contact sometimes with family. Um, strangely, through not seeing people and seeing people, we are actually spending more focused time on the phone or, or, you know, or doing FaceTime. And I think, uh, I think this is a challenging, well, this is a time to actually talk about togetherness, to build on that, to build on what people have in common, and I think to, re to reach out to people. And that these are, not, these are not mild or soft options, they're radical and they're brave. The easiest thing is for people to just stay in their own bubble and just stay with people like themselves. The hardest thing is to reach out to people who are not like them. So that's where the radicalism lies, I think. Great, thanks, George. Okay, go on, Rupert, being radical in lockdown. Well, I think what we've got to do is we've got to think about what a really radical response to the era of coronavirus is going to be lo looking like. And what I think that is, is really trying to resonate with people's experience of vulnerability, the brush with mortality that we're all having now, at least uh, by proxy for our parents or our grandparents, if not for uh, ourselves. That this could change the entire world. And if we can resonate with that and get people to connect that with the even more awesomely terrible climate and ecological emergency, then that will be something good that comes out of this terrible moment. Uh, and just to add a, a little bit banal plug to that, I'll be talking about this some more with uh, the great writer Alistair McIntosh in the thing I'm doing at uh, five o'clock on Saturday, uh, live online. And if you want to enjoy that as well, then uh, you can fill, find full details on my Twitter. Great. Thanks, Rupert. OK, Sarah Lennon, being radical. I think it's uh, for me at, at, at the moment, well, it's planning. It's remembering that this is not going to last forever and, and it's to plan what comes after this. So to remember, it's not always going to be like this. And so we need to find new ways to, to rebel um, when, the, when the lockdown lifts. But at the moment, it's about reminding people in, in the correspondence, the conversations that I have on my social media is that normal was killing us. If you want to return to normal, remember, it was killing us and it was going to kill us. Let's not go back. So, so it's remembering that normal was a disaster. Brilliant, thanks. Okay, Liam, you get the last word on being radical during coronavirus. <laughs> what an honour. Um, <laughs> I think like I was saying before, I think uh, rent strikes, debt strikes, 
and also keeping an eye out around what the powers of that be um, uh, have got in store. You know, they've, they're, they'll have all kinds of plans around what they, they want to do going forward post-COVID. I think we need to be aware of that. And also, I think that was interesting, that idea of the, 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 HS, the HS2, if, if that continues, um, there's also quite a moral justification for kind of like um, refusing to, 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 to accept, um, you know, the lockdown when, when you know, you, you could argue, argue that opposing that is also essential, just as the work of performing is, it, it is, in a, is, is essential. So there's, there's things to think about there. And also, I think um, some of the kind of community democracy stuff that XR are doing at the moment, just the idea of like, um, local democracy um, and and kind of taking back control of that. That's like a really radical idea. Let's kind of like take back local politics and let's kind of like make it into something really like fresh and exciting and let's ask people what problems they have. Um, and this, it kind of goes back to that idea of like, how do we get people interested? Well, why don't we just ask them what their problems are? And um, so maybe getting getting involved in, in local politics is just a radical thing because nobody does that anymore. Nobody's kind of, or not nobody, but you know, it's a, it could be something that we really build on going forward. Thanks, Liam. Okay, cool. Well, thanks everyone. We've got to wrap up there because uh, it's almost time to get your pots and pans out. Um, big thank you to everybody who's been watching and everyone who's sent in questions and um, uh, and please we carry on sending them in, join loads of the other live streams and, and keep sending in good questions to the panels that we put on. So the same time tomorrow um, at 6.30, we've got something with XR Youth talking about their reflections on last uh, April's rebellion. Um, we've also got money, uh, money rebellion themed uh, live streams happening all of next week. And that's every day, 4.30 till 7.30. There'll be, um, there'll be loads and loads of content there. Uh, deconstructing the finance system, which I think we can all agree uh, needs us to be very vigilantly looking at it. Um, and also uh, Saturday at 5 p.m., unfortunately clashing with Rupert's piece that he's going to be doing is a um, live stream from XR UK on citizens' assemblies. Um, and so I think that's all we've got to uh, say tonight, but thank you so, so much to uh, George for joining us, to Sarah and Sarah, to Liam and um, to Rupert. And um, thank you everybody for uh, watching and thank you to the technical team, because by the way, they've been the boss, amazing. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see you all again really soon. Thanks so much. Thanks Bye. everybody, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.